Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you have been enjoying the NAM session so far. My name is Stan Wertz. I'm a reader at the University of Bath, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's plenary. And I'm tremendously honored to be able to introduce Professor Sandy Faber from Lick Observatory at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Um, Sandy has made numerous seminal contributions to the field of galaxy evolution, from kinematic scaling relations of elliptical galaxies in the local universe to characterization of the evolving galaxy population over cosmic time. Uh, she has played an instrumental role in realizing the potential of large optical telescopes uh, from the ground with Keck to space with uh, the first wide field planetary camera on Hubble and later as the lead of the Candles Treasury program. And among her numerous uh, honors and recognitions, uh, she received the Bruce Medal, the Schwarzschild Medal, the Gruber Prize in Cosmology, and the National Medal of Science. And today it is uh, a pleasure to have her as Royal Astronomical Society Gold Medal awardee to tell us about black hole growth and galaxy quenching. Sunny? Great. Thank you so much, Stan, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you all for coming. And especially, most especially, thanks to the Royal, Society, Royal Astronomical Society for the thrilling honor of a gold medal, which is my reason for being with you here today. So as, as Stan said, uh, I'm planning to describe a very schematic model for black hole growth and galaxy quenching. And this talk summarizes the content of this paper by my collaborator from China, Tzu Chen, and many other people who have contributed important ideas. The basic notion is that quenching is a contest between galaxy halos and their central black holes. For those of you who might not be able to stay the entire hour, here is a big picture summary of the talk. The first is idea is that galaxies evolve along tracks in structural diagrams analogous to the HR diagram. And during star formation, halos are building galaxies, which in turn build central black holes. The connection between halos and their black holes is tight, except for scatter in galaxy radii, which is not explained in the model. Scatter in effective radius leads to scatter in black hole mass. At fixed stellar mass, star forming galaxies with larger radii actually have smaller black holes. Galaxies begin to quench when the total energy emitted by their black holes is some constant times their halo gas binding energy. And this simple concept is able to explain the tilted slanted boundaries that divide quenched and star forming galaxies in the structural diagrams that I'm going to show you if the constant is of order four. And finally, just to emphasize it once more, it's the scatter in galaxy radii that causes a spread in black hole mass at fixed stellar mass. And this in turn causes the observed spread in quenching masses and the sloped quenching boundaries. So really um, the big picture takeaway point is that effective radius is an important second parameter for star forming galaxy evolution, in addition, of course, to stellar mass. Let me first just remind you of something very basic. The Hubble sequence is a sequence in star formation rates, which is very visible here in these beautiful Sloan pictures. We're going from galaxies with blue stars to galaxies like ellipticals with no blue stars. Star forming regions are blue, non-star forming regions are red and dead. And so the question that we want to understand is, why do galaxies stop forming stars? Our starting point to think about this is going to be the evolution of dark matter halos, which we may consider to be the scaffolding on which visible galaxies are built. So here's a lovely 
simulation from a few years ago by my colleagues at UC Santa Cruz showing the dark matter hierarchical clustering of our own Milky Way galaxy. Our center of the galaxy would be at the center of this halo. And just reminding you that, uh, of course, the visible galaxies are a tiny fraction, both in mass and radius, of the halo itself. Point being, we know how halos evolve because they only evolve, involve gravitational physics, easy to model, take this as known, and halo physics will therefore be the basis of the model. Now, that shows up the problem in high relief. This is a picture of the mass distribution of halos today, the blue line. And here is the stellar mass distribution of galaxies. <clears throat> and they don't agree. They don't agree at low mass, but we think we sort of understand that as a result of uh, strong winds during early star formation, which drive matter out of the, out of the galaxy. But a bigger problem, as you can see here, is this problem at the upper end. Galaxies stop growing, whereas halos continue to grow up to even 10 to the 15th solar masses. So there's plenty of gas around. <clears throat> Why is it not falling into galaxies and making stars? Now, the consensus in the community, I would say, is that uh, this is due to feedback from growing black holes, and that also is the basis of the schematic model. Now, let me take a moment to say that I'm not talking about this. I'm not talking about quenched elliptical galaxies that have black holes whose feedback is preventing further infall of gas in big clusters. <clears throat> These objects quenched a long time ago and are now in so-called maintenance mode, which is thought to be a separate phenomenon. No, the problem I'm talking about today is the quenching of moderate mass non-cluster star forming galaxies that are presently quenching, galaxies like Andromeda. Its global color is quite red and star formation is now confined to the outer disk. And let me point out that the total number of quenched galaxies has doubled or even tripled since Z of one. Quenching is a phenomenon that is happening now, now <clears throat> not merely at high redshifts. So here's the current quenching paradigm, <clears throat> which I'm building on today. Caused by feedback from accreting black holes, feedback could be ejective or preventive, or maybe both. Black holes grow at the centers of galaxies while they are star forming, have little effect when the galaxy is young and the black hole is small. Eventually, the black hole becomes big enough to quench. So let me reassure you, there's new, much evidence that shows <clears throat> conclusively that star forming galaxies do have growing black holes at their centers. Here are some examples of pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope showing central black hole activity, Seifert galaxies, that's really what we're, we're talking about here. And our own Milky Way has giant gamma ray bubbles discovered by the Fermi satellite, which would be very consistent with the picture I'm describing if caused by a feedback from a central black hole. And furthermore, we've just relearned from E. Rosita that these Fermi bubbles <clears throat> are um, enclosed within even larger X-ray bubbles that extend tens of thousands of light years from the plane of the galaxy. So it could be that these bubbles interacting with the halo are actually um, uh, a, a, a quenching agent. Now, here are some unanswered questions. The rules whereby black holes grow in mass, and by the way, that includes the relationship between black holes and their halos. The nature of the feedback, is it radiation, photons, is it kinetic energy, is it cosmic rays? How does the feedback interact with the gas in the galaxy, ejective, or in the halo, preventive? The origin of black hole scaling laws like the famous M black hole goes as sigma to the fourth. And what exactly 
happens when galaxies start to quench. So this schematic model I'll describe builds on observed galaxy scaling laws to answer some of these questions, not all, but a few. All right, <clears throat> I just referred to scaling laws. The most famous scaling law in astronomy is the main sequence for stars. And when it was first discovered, it was thought to be a cooling sequence in which stars would start out luminous and hot and then cool along the sequence to become dim and cool. Perfect, seemed highly intuitive, seemed even obvious, but no. This sequence, as we know, is actually a mass sequence. Galaxies or stars do not evolve along it. In fact, they pile up on it as they form out of protostellar clouds from moving along formation tracks from the upper right of this diagram to the lower left, and they pile up along this ridge line, which we call the zero age main sequence. Discovering that this was a mass sequence was absolutely key. It unlocked the secret of nucleosynthesis and how stars shine. And in the same way, I think we should use galaxy motion and scaling laws in five structural diagrams that are analogous to the HR diagram for stars. And just as people reverse engineered the zero age main sequence to deduce that there must be something like nucleosynthesis, we today can take the observed scaling laws of black holes and galaxies, re reverse engineer them to deduce basic rules for how black holes grow and then quench galaxies. A guide for what models should do. So we're really trying to discover the essence of physics that we need to understand here just as stellar astronomers discovered the secret of nucleosynthesis. All right, so here's the first diagram, the stellar mass halo mass relation. Y axis is stellar mass, X axis is halo mass. This is a scaling law that galaxies and halos evolve along. You'll note that there's a change in slope. At early times, galaxies and halos grow together. Later, halos keep growing, but galaxies stop. That's the quenching process. So these two arrows, star forming and quenched, describe the very process here that we're trying to understand. Here's diagram number two, star formation rate versus stellar mass. Star forming galaxies are on the main sequence. Galaxies drop below the main sequence when they quench to take up residence on the quenched sequence, which is sometimes called the red sequence because galaxies are red and dead. So galaxies are following tracks in this diagram, also star formation rate versus stellar mass. Now, <clears throat> a very important point is the fact that these scaling laws, these relations are stable back in time. And here's an example. The star forming main sequence is visible very clearly all the way back to Z of three, these blue points. Uh, and the quenching path, the downward red arrows here, are virtually constant in time, in mass, near 10 to the 10.5 solar masses. The only thing that's really changing in the morphology of these diagrams is that the zero point of the uh, star forming main sequence is moving down with time. And we're gonna see that in other key diagrams too. Similar morphology, but change in zero point. Here's diagram number three, galaxy radius versus stellar mass. Our picture for evolution in this space is that galaxies evolve roughly like this. Their stellar mass is increasing. Their effective radius is also increasing gradually. But then one sees a ridge line here, which is composed of these quenched red galaxies. And one can imagine that a boundary exists between the star forming galaxies and the quenched ridge line. When galaxies cross over that boundary, that's when they begin to quench. That's our basic picture. And we're not the first people to say that. These two papers I'm citing here have also 
stress that galaxies are moving in this space and that the quenched ridgeline is this place where red and dead galaxies pile up, the graveyard, if you will. Well, just as for star forming main sequence, this scaling law is also constant back in time. And um, the steep lines are the scaling laws for the quenched ridge line. Same slope, remarkable. The only thing you see is a change in zero point moving down. Uh, sorry, moving up in this case with time. This is the ridge line for star forming galaxies. Again, constant slope with time. In this case, the zero point is moving up. Now, um, it has been shown in several papers that these blue lines here are consistent with an extremely simple model for effective radius. If you assume that the effective radius is just 2% of the radius, the virial radius of the dark halo, uh, that explains both the slope of these lines and the change in zero point as a function of time. So that's a great start for understanding the radii of star forming galaxies. However, one notices by looking at the blue points that the ridge line is not particularly narrow. There is some spread here. And this spread in radius at fixed stellar mass is the key second parameter in this toy model. So that's why I'm emphasizing it here. The toy model explains this by saying, yes, there are basic tracks here that we see, but there's a variation in zero point. We would love to know why that zero point changes from galaxy to galaxy is different from galaxy to galaxy, but unfortunately that's not yet fully explained. We have some ideas, but at the moment we're just building that in uh, based on observations. All right, next diagram is a plot of central stellar density versus stellar mass. And you note by looking at the distribution of points, blue or star forming, red or quenched, same morphology as what we just saw in the radius mass diagram. And that is understandable. Here, the quenched red, red sequence, the star forming blue cloud. That's understandable because radius mass maps into the central density sigma one mass for sets of galaxies that have the same um, radial light profile, in this case for star forming galaxies, exponential disks. So in other words, these two spaces, radius mass and sigma one mass are actually the same space. And so that a track in one is also a track in the other. Here are the parallel tracks with different zero points that I was illustrating in effective radius versus mass. And again, emphasizing that this scaling law uh, of sigma one versus stellar mass for quenched galaxies, objects are not evolving along that. This is a, the, an example of a scaling law in which objects stop evolving and pile up along a ridge line. So, there must be a quenching boundary as galaxies move from the blue region to the red region. The model takes this boundary to be offset downwards by two tenths of a dex in sigma one based on some information, structural information seen in Sloan galaxies that I don't have time to explain today. But here, the point is that as an object crosses over that boundary, that would be the start of quenching in the model. Looking back at sigma one versus mass in time shows the same similar effect. We see similar morphologies, blue galaxies, star forming galaxies with the same slope and only a change in zero point going back in time. So to summarize, four galaxy scaling laws to this point, they summarize how halos determine the properties of galaxies, stellar mass, radius, and central density while star forming. 
These patterns have been constant all the way back to Z of three, indicating that the physics back then is the same as the physics now. An important point is that there is a clear boundary between quenched and star forming galaxies in these spaces that shows where quenching happens. And our challenge is to understand why that boundary is there and what happens there. So let me continue with the next key point, adding the black hole. And we're going to assume that while galaxies are star forming, their black hole mass obeys a relationship with central density, central stellar density, sigma one, within one kiloparsec. Why would this be reasonable? Well, <clears throat> we're aware of a nice relationship between black hole mass and stellar velocity dispersion, sigma, to the fourth power. But observations show, and simple physics agrees, that velocity dispersion to the fourth actually is proportional to sigma one squared. So put these two things together, and you predict a simple relationship black hole mass goes as sigma one squared. The actual power we come up with is not quite two, but it's close. So here's the last and final diagram, diagram five, black hole mass versus sigma one or equivalently stellar velocity dispersion since they're so closely related to one another. And as we might expect, since sigma one is closely related to black hole mass, this diagram has the same morphology that we've been seeing in the previous diagrams, a quenched red sequence and a star forming blue cloud. But here we're going to take a slightly different tack based on observations of black holes as a function of quenching state by Terrazas and collaborators. Unfortunately, I don't have time to explain those key relations to you today, but they inspire the notion that black hole growth is actually a little bit different morphologically in this picture than our other two, than our other parameters like sigma one or effective radius. Those observations suggest that there's actually a more rapid period of black hole growth as galaxies transit from star forming to quenched. And so what we would see here is an early period in which galaxies are following the 1.76 law. They begin to quench when they encounter the quenching boundary. Black hole growth is briefly accelerated. If we assume that the green vectors are all parallel for all galaxies and of the same length, then the original sequence winds up uh, on a quenched sequence that's parallel here. And that's it's the slope of that well-observed quenched galaxy sequence that gives us the slope 1.76. All right, so invoking the fact that there might be a more rapid phase of black hole growth would actually explain a long-standing problem. It's observed that M31 has a bigger black hole than the Milky Way, despite the fact that many other aspects of their centers are very similar, in particular, their central sigma ones differ by just about a factor of two, and yet their black holes differ by a factor of 50. Rapid black hole growth would help to explain this if we uh, said that the Milky Way is on basically on the blue track and starting to turn off, entering the Green Valley, starting to quench, whereas M31 is farther along, and this agrees with the colors and star forming rates of the two galaxies. M31 is more aged than the Milky Way. So the difference in black hole mass between the Milky Way and M31 is some evidence in favor of the rapid black hole growth picture. All right, well, <clears throat> uh, the picture I've sketched to you has some interesting implications. The first is that for star forming galaxies, before quenching happens, black hole mass can be read directly from sigma one and stellar mass, but that means also directly from effective radius 
and stellar mass. And we're not the first people to say that. Vandenbosch, Brasovich have made this point <clears throat> that a good estimator for black hole mass in star forming galaxies is a combination of stellar mass and radius. And here's our formula for that here in, in this, uh, this black box. That has the implication that there are contours in this diagram along which um, sigma one is constant and therefore M black hole is constant. So that's quite exciting. It means that you should be able to read off black hole mass simply from the structural, the global structural parameters of a galaxy while it's star forming. But one notes, however, this spread in radius, which I've mentioned now several times. <clears throat> Following the scaling law with sigma one, we conclude that we have smaller black holes in galaxies with larger radii at fixed mass and larger black holes with the smaller ones. And this is not an insignificant scatter. This arrow here covers a black hole range of a factor of 17. So if quenching is a contest between galaxies, black holes, and their halos, then these objects here at the top of the distribution with smaller black holes are disadvantaged. They have to grow more in order to be able to overcome their halos. I'll show you the details of that in a minute, but that basic intuitive notion is can explain then the fact that these quenching boundaries are sloping in these diagrams. I showed you this before, the quenching boundary in radius versus mass and also in sigma one versus mass. So I'd like to stress this very clearly that galaxies are not quenching at a fixed stellar mass. They are quenching over a, more than a factor of 10 in stellar mass and the boundary between quenched and star forming is, is tilted. All right, just to bring home the notion of what's happening here a little bit more concretely, here is a little movie which shows you a galaxy that's going to wind up with a halo mass of log 12.1 today. It's starting out here <clears throat> at um, a Z of 2.8 with a stellar mass of uh, around 10 to the nine. So here's its track. It moves up in mass and radius, but the quenching boundary is also moving because the quenching boundary is tied to the ridge line and the ridge line zero point is moving. All of these zero points are moving as a function of time. So the quenching boundary moves up, the galaxy moves along its track, and then the quenching condition is met and the galaxy starts to quench. So here are several galaxies. They all start out with the same stellar mass at Z of two, 2.8 in this case, but they start out with different radii. And that means that they encounter their boundaries at different points. Here is the loci of their quenching points and that would be the locus of the quenching boundary that we see. So the amazing thing that really surprised me as we work through these ideas is the fact that a, tra a track of an individual galaxy is almost parallel to the quenching boundary. Galaxies don't quench because they cross a boundary so much as the moving boundary overtakes them. That's like a guillotine that overtakes them and quenches them. Okay, what about the quenching boundary? How can we explain it? In this model, the quenching boundary takes place. It occurs where the black hole energy overcomes the halo gas binding energy. We know that black holes emit radiation when they are accreting and the total energy that they would emit over their lifetime <clears throat> energy black hole here is proportional to um, their rest mass energy where this coefficient eta is typically taken to be of order 1%. Now, halo gas is cold when the halo is small, so gas falls in and fuels star formation. 
But in this picture, ga gas is absorbing energy from the black hole. And when the following condition is met, halo gas has absorbed enough energy to stop cooling and galaxies start to quench. The condition is total emitted energy of the black hole effective energy over its lifetime is four times the halo gas binding energy, where the binding energy here is one half m gas times v variable velocity squared. Okay. <clears throat> now let me take a moment to stress that I'm not necessarily talking about heating here, although it could be that. It could be instead um, the picture of the Fermi bubbles, which are expanding and possibly shoving gas away and making it uh, impossible for gas to fall onto the middle of the galaxy. Who knows? Maybe that's why the centers of galaxies go out first, because they're shaded by these Fermi bubble umbrellas. But moving on, that's just a speculation. Let's compare this prediction, this very simple prediction that quenching starts when effective black hole radiated energy or emitted energy is four times halo energy. Here um, are these sloping quenching boundaries that I've been telling you about before. So let me take a minute to describe this fuller example of data from candles. So here on the left-hand side, we have high redshift, and over here we have more recent redshift. The top line is star-forming galaxies, and you can see that they lie almost entirely below these boundaries, whereas quenched objects, the quenched ridge line, lie on top. This is the slanting boundary that I've been talking about, um, displayed now more vividly over a range of redshifts. And the red lines are the red lines from Barrow's paper back in 2017 that um, gave us uh, expressions for what those boundaries look like, their slope, and the zero point motion with time. And here is what the uh, simple picture quenching starts when emitted energy is four times E bind. Okay, these are the blue lines. Right? So that simple picture doesn't quite match the red lines. There's a little bit of a difference in slope and a little bit different in zero point motion, but it seems to capture the essence of the observations that we're, that we're trying to explain. Okay, here is a summary cartoon of what um, black hole growth might look like as a function of central sigma one, central stellar density. There's the star forming phase here, during which black hole mass grows as a power of sigma one. This power is adjustable, doesn't necessarily have to be 1.76 exactly, but <clears throat> if you assume this picture, and if you assume a more rapid black hole growth phase during quenching, and if you assume that that phase is of the same tilt, slope, and same length, for all galaxies as they quench, then you wind up with two parallel relations here, a quenched ridge line and a star forming ridge line here. Okay. So this green area would be the entry to the green valley, the so-called quenching zone. All right, let me conclude this talk here by just mentioning introducing yet another space which we have been called the elbow diagram. <clears throat> this, we're this model is trying to explain star formation rate, and yet I really haven't stressed scaling relations versus star formation rate, so let me take the time to do so. This is um, a delta-specific star formation rate in which a mass trend has been removed, the mass trend being the slope of the star forming main sequence. So these are main sequence residuals of star forming galaxies, the blue dots on the y axis. And mass trend in sigma one has been removed here. So this is a sigma one residual. And it's observed that um, in this sigma sigma, in this delta delta diagram, the uh, star forming galaxies 
are uh, basically almost a horizontal distribution here. Not quite, but almost horizontal. Uh, and then one sees that there are quenched galaxies here which exist only at high sigma one. That's what we've been saying. Galaxies evolve along, they hit a boundary, and they quench. And so the picture here would be that galaxies must turn, their, turn the corner here in this elbow diagram where they move from star forming to, to quenched. So um, what we're looking at now is how to characterize this entry point. The traditional quenching point entry to the Green Valley has been expressed as a horizontal line here in star formation rate or star formation rate residual from the main sequence. The toy model paper that I've been talking about expresses the quenching boundary this way, purely as a function of stellar central density. That's what I've been assuming in stock. But here, what we're showing is the location of AGNs, Seifert galaxies, in the Sloan survey. And you can see that their distribution in this in this space is rather complicated. Specifically, it seems to be tilted. And perhaps we're going to now find that the boundary to the to the um, to the Green Valley is a function of both the star formation rate and sigma one. In other words, that it's a tilted boundary, and which I'm showing schematically here as the black line. And we're working with that now, studying Eddington ratios and other properties as a function of position in this space. All right, so let me try to summarize. Takeaway points from this really simple, very schematic picture of galaxy star formation growth and final quenching. Galaxies like stars evolve along tracks in structural diagrams <clears throat> and these tracks capture important information about galaxy evolution. During star formation, the halo and the radius of the halo set the star formation, sorry, the stellar mass and the effective radius of the galaxy. Um, the stellar mass and the effective radius in turn set the stellar density at the middles, sigma one, that stellar density sets black holes. And so basically the halo mass is setting the black hole mass. However, this leaves out an important point. The stellar radii show extra scatter, which is not explained, which means that the black hole mass versus the halo also shows scatter. And the size of that is about plus or minus four tenths of a dex, not inconsiderable. Galaxies begin to quench when the total energy from the black hole is some constant times the halo gas binding energy. And the observed tilted boundaries between star forming and quenched galaxies are matched if this constant here is about four. That suggests that the essence of quenching is a contest between the black hole and the halo, which suggests to me at least that the important feedback mode is preventive, not so much ejective. The scatter in radii causes a spread in M black hole at a fixed stellar mass, which explains the spread that we see in quenching masses across the Green Valley and the sloping quenching boundaries. And therefore this radius spread are effective as a, an important second parameter for galaxy evolution. And finally, boundaries are moving because halos are easier to quench at late times. That's the basic notion that causes those blue boundaries to their 0 0.2 fall with time. Why is this happening? It's because the binding energy per halo mass is lower at late times because halos are becoming less dense. 
And this motion of the boundary is crucial because it means that galaxies do not cross the boundary so much as the quenching boundary crosses them. So you can see it's a very schematic model. Huge amounts of physics are missing. We assume a power law for black hole growth, but we don't understand where that power law comes from. We've said nothing about how the feedback energy actually interacts with the halo. But nevertheless, despite that, this very schematic point uh, approach, I think, is helpful in setting a basic a foundation, a landscape, if you will, which will be useful for further discussions of galaxy evolution and quenching. So I'll stop there and welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy, for wonderful talk um, and for giving the talk also so early in the morning in California. Um, it's, it's really great to see this synthesis coming together from the, the scaling relations as a function of redshift on galaxy structure, but also coupled with uh, the local black hole scaling relations. Um, so while uh, we're receiving questions from the audience, I, I wondered about these black hole scaling relations. Does your work have implications on how the M sigma relation would evolve with redshifts or does it assume this to be universal in time or require a particular evolution? And, and empirically, where do we stand in trying to measure that in an unbiased way? Well, I've never tried to measure black hole masses back in time. And so I'm not the person to give you an informed opinion about how that activity stands at present. It's obviously hugely difficult. However, um, it is, I think, generally believed that at fixed stellar mass, black hole masses are bigger back in time. and. In fact, that is exactly what is predicted by this schematic picture. It's yet one more zero point, sorry, scaling law, whose zero point is evolving in time. And because black holes are tied to sigma one, the drop in the sigma one scaling laws implies a drop in the black hole mass scaling laws. So in fact, and, and, and the magnitude of this is as predicted by the model. So I'm very glad you happened to mention that. I didn't have time to talk about it in my main talk. Let me just say though that like a lot of aspects of this model, it, um, it's useful because it, it inspires a different way of thinking. Many people have said, because black hole masses are bigger at a fixed stellar mass back in time, it must be that black holes are forming before stars because the black holes are already massive. They're leading the stellar mass. That's not the picture from this model at all. In fact, black holes form a bit later than stars in this model. Rather, people are confusing zero points of large numbers of objects with the status of an individual object versus its galaxy. So we have to distinguish in these scaling laws between their zero points and the zero point motion and the tracks of individual objects. The quenched ridgeline is not a track. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we have a question here uh, that asks um, about uh, the radius of the galaxy, whether uh, it's really that galaxy radius that is the physically meaningful additional parameter in mass scaling relations, or whether it's rather a gradient of the gravitational potential or something like angular momentum. Uh, mm. Well, I think that radius, because of its correlation, radius is attractive because uh, the average radius is so simply explained by the halo radius. So if you use radius, you have a natural connection to halos. And that was the key 
connection that was used in this model throughout the star forming phase. It's really the radii that, t uh, that was used to, to tie um, sigma one and therefore black hole mass to halo mass during the star forming phase. Uh, as to where this radius scatter comes from, an obvious answer might be halo angular momentum. Larger angular momentum makes bigger galaxies, and larger in radius. But models are not consistent with this. Um, and so I'm walking away from that notion to uh, thinking about halo concentration, which is another second parameter for halos. And two halos of different concentration form their centers at different times. The high concentration halo makes a dense center. That's an attractive model for a small radius object, uh, small radius galaxy. The low concentration halo would accrete its mass later in time and that mass would fall in at larger radii in the galaxy. So that's my working hypothesis so far, but uh, I can see some problems with that approach that are related to the star formation history of the galaxies. So I think this is a major unsolved problem right now and I'm thinking about it, but don't have the answers. Okay. Thank you. Um, Turning to another question, how does the galaxy evolution picture looks like depending on the location of galaxies within their dark matter halos, for example, at the center or being located off center in the outskirts of a halo? Hmm. Right. Well, <clears throat> my picture is that unless a galaxy falls into a bigger halo, it's always at the center of its halo, its own halo. And you may have noticed that the title of my talk specifically emphasized central galaxies. So as everybody knows, when a galaxy falls into a bigger halo, there are all kinds of new physics that might set in at that point. And they, those physics, which I will sort of sum up by saying environmental effects or satellite effects, they're not part of this model. They're, they would be a whole separate family of different phenomena. However, I think people studying satellite properties are noting that there's a remarkable lack of difference between satellite scaling laws and the scaling laws of ice, more isolated central galaxies. So it may very well be that before satellites fall in, while they were central galaxies in their own halo, perhaps that's actually where most of the relevant physics actually takes place or, or the foundations are laid. Yes. Um, if you consider other types of observations of, of physical properties of these galaxies, say metallicity or gas content, H1 or molecular, where, where do you see such measurements coming in as a test or additional uh, way of constraining this, this basic picture that you sketched for galaxy growth and quenching? Well, your questions are really great because they're homing in on the, the uh, aspects of the model that really need a lot more work. So uh, if people were listening closely, they will have noticed that I offered almost no physical insight whatsoever for star formation. Star formation is part of the model, but it comes in simply by saying, by assuming that galaxies are going to follow the stellar mass halo mass relation. So what's the physics of that? That is taken as a given here, but it's not explained. So I'm going to sweep all of those nasty details about star forming, uh, the star formation point under the rug here and just say that I'm, I'm simply going to appeal to the fact that galaxies follow that relation. And like other aspects of this schematic model, we have to discover the physics of that. However, this is an important uh, opportunity for me to 
reveal another hidden assumption in this model, which is that if galaxies start at some two galaxies with different radii, but same stellar mass, say back at a Z of three, they might have a stellar mass of 10 to the nine, but their radii are different. This model assumes that they are going to maintain the same relative stellar masses one to another as they evolve. That's very important for doing all of these very simple uh, calculations of slopes and, and whatnot. Um, you might say, well, what's the evidence for that? Well, actually, the evidence for that is excellent. When we observe the star forming main sequence, one of the first things we should look for is, is there a residual about the main sequence as a function of galaxy radius? And in a recent paper, um, we've been emphasizing the surprising fact that those residuals have very little, it's not zero, but it's almost zero dependence on galaxy radius. And so that observed fact is what allows the model to assume that two galaxies of different radii but different mass will actually stay together over time. So as long as I'm highlighting important physical phenomena that need further explanation, I would like to bring to people's attention this burning question of why two galaxies of the same stellar mass but different radii would um, have the same star formation rate. What's the physics of that? Now, if you don't mind, I'm gonna turn the tables on you. You're the expert on star formation. So are you thinking about this, this fact and do you have any, uh, any good explanations for it? I, I wouldn't immediately uh, know so. Um, and I, I, I think it's also interesting to look whether at a given mass, the variations in size corresponds to variations in gas fraction also, uh, which, which may That's well be uh, may, maybe there. Um, but yeah, it's a good one to think further about. Um, on the black hole scaling relations side, um, on the topic of actually where the star forming galaxies fall in the M sigma relation, um, you, you assumed uh, black hole masses to be correlated with stellar velocity dispersion and by association, the sigma one parameter. Um, but the M sigma relation has been shown in observations and in simulations to underestimate the black hole masses of disk galaxies. So uh, how does that affect your results is a question. Okay. Ah, I actually didn't understand your question. What do you mean it's been shown to underestimate? Um, so if you take the sigma one or the stellar velocity dispersion of uh, disk galaxies, uh, you would arrive at a black hole mass smaller than the one directly measured where, where one can make such measurements. Really? I'm not sure if this is already captured in the, the offset between star forming galaxies that you showed on the M sigma relation. Huh. Um, I think that might be, yeah, because I was over plotting our, our growth model there on top of data. And I think the data shows a change in one way of interpreting the data. Many people have tried to put one scaling law through the whole thing with a steeper slope. And I think that's a mistake. This alternative in interpretation would say that there are two scaling laws here, a quenched ridge line and an evolving ridge line separated by, by this uh, zero point shift. So perhaps that is what you're referring to. Mm. I'm, I, I, I do think that um, the picture I'm presenting goes through the data for star forming galaxies. Um, in this, in uh, this and conference and, and, and recent meetings, there are also uh, 
increasingly more reports of, of the presence of quiescent galaxies at very early times, before cosmic ah. moon, mm. uh, even though in small numbers. But in your picture of this contest between halo growth and black hole uh, growth, what, what happens? What explains uh, the presence of, of quiescent systems so early on? Uh, where, yeah. where does this balance play out differently? I think that's a wonderful question. And like so many of these questions, I, I can only say I don't know. Um, this picture that we're putting forward uh, using observed scaling laws has a limiting redshift at around Z of three. You really can't take it earlier than that. And the, the reason is that the, the objects are getting so small that the relationship between the effective radius and sigma one and so on is, is, is breaking down. The, they're not um, exponential disks anymore that are well resolved, right? So um, I've thought about that. I've thought about trying to take this picture to earlier times, but really it doesn't work very well. I think we need to do something different. And I, I don't really think I have any particularly useful things to say about that. Yeah. Um, one, you alluded to this already in the Q&A uh, part, but not so much during the presentation itself, the scatter in the size mass relation. Uh, you brought up halo concentration. Uh, is, is there, are there arguments either from theory or observations that, um, that this cannot be explained in terms of a distribution of spin parameters of the halos that the galaxies live in? Well, I think the main, the main point there comes from simulations. So there have been a couple of papers now comparing galaxy radii to um, the angular momentum of their original halos. I'm most familiar with work, I'm a co-author on uh, Fang Shu Zhang's paper um, in which he first deliberately looked at the relationship between final galaxy radii and halo spin finding none. And then finding in addition, however, uh, a relationship with concentration in with the sign that I mentioned, namely high concentration halos would make smaller galaxies. Um, I believe that Avishai Dekel has spent a lot of time trying to think about how well conserved angular momentum is as material falls onto star forming galaxies. And you can just see it in the simulations, not very well conserved. It's, it's a complicated mess object. Is, uh, gas is coming in along filaments from different directions. The filaments collide. The baryons lose angular momentum. The dark matter retains angular momentum. You know, in some sense, in a complex hierarchical forming picture, you might not really think that angular momentum would be very well conserved. And that's what we're seeing in the simulations. Thanks. Um, regarding simulations, uh, they indicate that more concentrated halos have earlier formation time. Uh, would that imply that less massive halos quench earlier since they are more concentrated? That's a question. Probably not. Um, I, I think that might be an example of looking at trends today and thinking that a slice through the halo galaxy distribution today, having some trend, i.e. smaller galaxies are less concentrated, was always true back in time. Um, you really have to follow the evolution of each individual object and make sure that you're taking slices properly at each epoch. So I'm, I'm not going to agree with that, uh, at least not right off. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just say that um, here, here is the basic problem with concentration if we want to appeal to that. So it's observed 
when we do dark matter simulations that high constant, take two halos of the same mass, different concentration today, um, the concentrated halo uh, obtained most of its mass early, made a small dense center. That means that the concentrated halo is accreting less today. The factor maximum is about a factor of two either way. So two halos, same mass today, different concentration, different infall rates, therefore different star formation rates by a factor of two, but we don't see that. I return to the observational fact that galaxies of the same mass, uh, but different radii are forming stars at the same rate. So that's a basic problem with the concentration picture. It predicts a difference in star formation rate that's not seen. Thanks. Um, let me conclude with one final forward-looking question. Um, in many ways, James Webb Space Telescope has, in terms of its capabilities, advances in, in terms of spectroscopy and longer wavelengths. What, will, what is, in your view, the, the main advance that that will bring, bring to your picture, uh, those, those observing modes? I think we have a big problem with measured star formation rates. And you're the expert on this, so I, I, I say this with some trepidation. <laughs> um, in order to test theories of galaxy formation, we need star formation rates that are accurate to better than a tenth of a dex. We're at that level. And different different ways of measuring star formation rate today on galaxies nearby, whether we use spectral energy distributions, how we model the dust. Dust is an enormous enemy of uh, accurate models of galaxy formation. To make a long story short, I think observing galaxies at longer wavelengths back in time is going to be, in order to obtain precision star formation rates, will be Webb's biggest contribution in this area. Great. Well, thanks so much, Sandy, for uh, the presentation and also for uh, a very interesting Q&A. So um, thanks and congratulations again with your RAS Gold Medal. Thanks to you for doing such a great moderating job and the wonderful conversation afterwards. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks.